Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new episode of the Brain Food Show. I'm Simon, sitting over there on the other side of the world, technically, but it looks like he's right across the desk from me, is David. How's it going? It's going great. How about you? Good. I mean, not great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to complain, but we were going to record two podcast episodes this morning, or nighttime by you. Yeah. And uh, I was like, dude, I can't do it today. And you're like, why? And I'm like, well, my uh, my furnace, my boiler, it doesn't work. It just died. Uh, it died last week, and I'm in the process of having quotes and stuff for a new one. And I'm like, this had to happen in February, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got a little space heater, which I have like in in my in my studio. I've got like an office in the back where I'll work, and it's like the space heater works all good in there because it's like a little office. But in this like main recording room, mm-hmm. it's quite big. The space heater doesn't make any difference whatsoever. <laughs> so uh yeah. i didn't want to sit in the cold for two hours i thought i could yeah. just sit in the cold for like however long this one episode is <laughs> it's pretty um, long <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> brilliant <laughs> um, before we get started shall i just do our housekeeping and then we can jump right into it sure cool um if you're enjoying this podcast why not leave us a review that would be great uh when we get to it how do you know how many reviews we've got on amazon america or us or i should say right apple now? uh I yeah, don't Apple know. Podcasts. I don't know. It's like, it's seven, like 700 I, maybe? I think it's like 700-ish, yeah. Yeah. When we get to 1,000 podcasts, we're giving away a $1,000 Amazon gift voucher. So leave us a review. It doesn't even have to be a good review. Well, that's going to be really awkward when we email you to say, like, congratulations, you won our prize, you troll. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but seriously, go do that. You don't have to leave it on Amazon America, uh, iTunes America even. You can leave it wherever you get your podcasts, as long as it's you know not you know jeff's podcasting app although that could mean i'm saying amazon's podcasting app because of jeff bezos but i meant like some you know tiny app that we're never going to find the reviews for am i making sense am i rambling probably rambling leave us a review that would be great and uh yeah should we just that's all right because to, uh, that's all right because you today? cut out you cut out completely oh. on my end so you know well <laughs> it was you good that you kept talking the audience had to tolerate it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, what are we doing today? Are we doing a quick fact or are we just rolling? No, we're, into we're gonna roll in going today's on? episode and probably for at least one more episode because I got something really interesting planned for next time. Maybe two more. We're gonna do the difference between, you know, X and Y, different things. Uh, so we're gonna start out. We're gonna start out with the difference between hardwoods and softwoods, which wow, <laughs> I, 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 I I cannot wait. <laughs> yeah, you'd think that, but it's way more interesting than you think. Um, so. Is it? Because I, I think we did a video on this. <laughs> it is, and I'll have you know, that video got like half a million views, so that means it was, others found it quite interesting as well. I have to say, this is so true. Sometimes I'll make, we'll, we'll be making a video, I'll be like, really, is this interesting? And then yeah. it'll be like, well, a million views, okie dokie. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, yeah. the crescent moons on outhouse doors. Yeah. This isn't a thing in Europe. I had no idea this was a thing. And yeah, that did well. That one, <laughs> that one was saved though because we're, you know, we we've lately we've been experimenting with trying different thumbnails to just see the different reaction. And our initial thumbnail for that one, it was pacing for only like fifty, sixty thousand views for the first like four or five hours, right? It was kind of like trailing that. And then I swapped the thumbnail to include the part about the world, the deadliest fart in human history. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and the text and then it just shot up so i think that one was not so much the crescent moon but that little buried like one paragraph fact like at the Do end the, yeah yeah about, about that about that which for people who haven't watched it, it was basically this roman guy in in jerusalem uh he mooned and then farted in the general direction of a bunch of um jewish people and then they rioted for for i don't know what was it like a couple days or something and like supposedly yeah. according to the account of it over ten thousand people died so we named that the, oh the deadliest yeah. fart in history um so Probably. i think that i think it was that. i mean i've done some bad ones but never you know yeah. i think it was that that paragraph that really saved that one um which that was actually yeah. really interesting though i felt like not the, even whole, the, the whole thing dude, was not even that paragraph it's just the thumbnail because that came right at the end of the video and we can look at the analytics and it's like oh like you know by that point in the video 70 percent of people have dropped off so they clicked on yeah. it but they clearly don't care that much <laughs> yeah yeah there was commenters who were like who didn't even clearly bother to read the title of the thing yeah uh, and just getting <laughs> there but hardwood softwoods it's actually way more interesting because you might think that it's just like okay 
how hard is the wood? That's going to be uh, what it comes down to. But for instance, balsa wood, which I mean, most people, if you've done like models and stuff, uh, I mean, that's that's actually one of the least dense and softest woods by like actual like physical hardness. But it's classified as a hardwood. And likewise, the yew tree, which is um, classified as a softwood, actually has a when tests similarly on its like physical hardness to oak and hickory, which I mean, most people are familiar with how hard and strong those are. So what is actually going on here. And it turns out to classify the wood as either hard or soft is not dependent on the actual wood product, like the boards or anything that you make when you cut them. It's actually the seeds produced by the tree that determine whether it is a hard or soft uh, soft wood. Mm-hmm. So the tree seeds, if they have some sort of covering when they fall from the tree, and that could be like a shell or it could even be a fruit, uh, then so that's um, for the, it's those are angiosperms, meaning vessel seed. Um, those ones are hardwoods. And the ones where the seeds just fall and kind of left to the elements, those are um, gymnosperms, a naked seed. And those are wood, uh, those ones are classified as softwoods. So uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with the the actual hardness. Of the <laughs> it's wood got itself. nothing to do with the hardness. No. Uh, so, but actual hardness, there is a way they measure that to to determine that. And then, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not going to do that. I had a your mom joke in there on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna besmirch the the good name of the matriarch of the Whistler family. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, uh, how do they actually? It's, it's different when there's someone sitting across from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Rather than just talking into a void. Yeah, exactly. When you're presenting videos Although sometimes, or something, you can. <laughs> sometimes you'll put like really off-color jokes into the scripts, and I'll be like, some of them I'll do, and some of them I'll just be like. I can't say that. <laughs> I know. And I always, sometimes when I watch them, I'm like, oh, come on, that go- that joke was gold. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I totally... Yeah, usually I'll, I'll have a little laugh and it's like, this just doesn't sound right coming no. out of my British mouth. <laughs> no. Well, see, I feel like that's what makes it funnier because I often like imagine, okay, wow, well, this sound of Simon saying it like really like refined and like, you know, really good presenting, you know, not, and just completely straight faced and it just makes it funnier. Um. I did have a right laugh with the F word video where we just decided to leave it completely uncensored. That was, uh, yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we should get, all right. So. The actual hardness of a given wood is measured by the mm-hmm. Jenka hardness test, uh, which is, uh, it's been the industry standard since the early 20th century. Um, and this involves measuring the average amount of force required to embed a 0.444 inch steel ball to half its diameter in some type of wood. Um, so then they take they just take the average. Um, Incredibly specific. Yeah, it is, right? Uh, they take the average of that from... Um, both the uh to sort of get around the fact that some wood you know some boards you cut you'll get like the heartwood and then you have the edge wood and stuff like that mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. so uh just the average between that and then there's also two ways to measure it one is on side hardness and one is on end hardness which it turns out there's a bit of a difference but uh, most of them are ranked on side hardness um so the Janka test uh the brainchild of one gabriel Janka. uh so he was asked by the department of agriculture in the u.s to find an objectively and scientifically sound way to measure the hardness of a piece of wood so that is just um so just for some references here, so the Cuepo tree, I'm guessing, uh, that one has, that one is the, the world's softest wood, and that is 22 pound force, um, uh, whatever, for reference here for that, uh, just to give you a ballpark, balsa wood, which is also very low, has 100 pound force, so um, Cuepo tree Oh, wow, so this is yeah, that really must be like, five times softer? Yeah, that's crazy soft, because balsa wood just, is... Just go up to the tree and it just falls over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you'd think like wind and stuff. You blow on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although maybe it's just like really flexible too. I don't know, maybe. Um I've... Yeah, but either way, so the for the on the other end of the 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 scale there's the Australian bull oak tree and that oh. one 5060 pound force. And so for reference on this one, for just the scale hickory, which is hickory is super strong, is only mm. 1820 pound force. Whoa. Yeah. That's crazy. And you do you do actually see it like a rock. <laughs> yeah, basically. And you people describe it as similar to rock. You can't actually cut it with a handsaw. It just takes like a, you know, really long time. It's extremely tiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and people, woodworkers who work with it uh, do say it is a bit like working with a rock. It feels like uh, it's just like super, super tough. Um, yeah. So that is the difference between hardwood and softwood. And now we're going to everyone's favorite part of the show. Oh, yeah. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Skillshare, which, by the online way, learning community. Which, by the way, I'm going to interrupt you right away. Go on, you know man. that guy last time, the, the listener who said he was going to make a Skillshare course? 
right? Yeah. And then I did actually look it up to see for for the next ad spot to see if I could like promo. Yeah. I could have find it. That guy, that guy, whoever he was, should maybe should, he's still know. working on it. Yeah. Well, he said it was going to be published by then, and I was actually interested, and in it was going to be on the uh, uh, the was it presenting or something uh, in business settings or something like that. Um, yeah. Like, dude, yeah. I, I can't even remember, but I'd like to. Yeah. That yeah. would be good for these these yeah. spots. Anyway, Suppos- supposedly it's up, but there was like there's so many courses on there. I, I sifted through for a while, but I couldn't find that specific one. Um, there's a lot. Yeah, it's an online learning community for creators, creatives, where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They have thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Topics like illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. What you get on Skillshare is a combination of video lessons as well as a class project. We all love class projects. And the great thing is that you can learn at your own pace, not like school. You fit it into your own schedule. Whenever you want to do it, you can do it. Most classes are under 60 minutes, so they can fit any schedule that you might have. Even if you're busy, you can find 60 minutes in a day. Maybe you can only find five minutes in a day. So just spend five minutes a day. And before you know it, you're through those 60 minutes. And you get unlimited access. There's no paying for individual classes. I'd personally recommend the productivity course from Thomas Frank. Like, I'm a pretty busy dude. This guy's got some great advice on being more productive, so check that out. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com forward slash brain food and get two months of premium membership for free. Again, explore your creativity at Skillshare.com forward slash brain food and get two months of premium membership for free. And what's up next? We're going to start. Uh, a lot of these today are going to be like food based, uh, but um, yeah. next next week's will be more uh, um, some language things that'll be interesting. But um, uh, so th- this one, first up. Before we started talking, I was talking about the boiler and furnace. I'm excited yeah. to. No, that's what are we doing? US and UK differences? Yeah, we're going to do some differences and then, you know, probably just some general differences. And then a bunch of other stuff will be tied into to uh, make cool. it cool, super interesting. But for today, one, it's going to be. Of- yeah. Sorry. I know I'm just on a tangent here, but I just wanted to bring it up. Like, dude, the number of people... So, uh, one of my biggest pronunciation problems of late has been around, the, you know, the brands that makes shoes and clothes. Nike. You familiar with Nike? Yeah. I imagine you are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Well, yeah. in the UK, yeah. we call it Nike. And it's wrong because the brand yeah. is it's an American company called Nike, named after the Temple yeah. of Nike. And it's that, that's great. And everyone has a go at me being like, Simon, it's Nike. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. But look, if I pronounce it Nike, every single British person watching these videos is going to be like, stop pandering to the Americans, Simon. We pronounce it Nike. So it's it's just an absolute lose-lose situation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, totally. Also, who cares? (laughs) Yeah, and that's going to be, we are going to have a whole section on that. (laughs) brilliant i have thoughts i'll tell you (laughs) i know this is i have thoughts too because yeah as you might imagine having written like five thousand articles consumed by people the world over of many thoughts yes (laughs) many thoughts sorry um what are we talking about yeah so for starters we're going to do the difference between green and black tea so uh they're both harvested from the same same it's like a tree-like shrub uh i don't know camellia sinensis whatever yeah that's exactly right you nailed it <laughs> yeah uh, so uh they basically just harvest the buds and the leaves of the plant and then it's not actually and they get the green and black tea there's no difference of uh, initial harvest they're the exact same um, it's how they actually process it after they harvest that that makes the difference so green tea they just pick the leaves uh, and then they heat them pretty much immediately afterwards and this they do it usually by like pan firing it or just steaming them and so what that does is it stops uh some of the enzymes that deact denatures or deactivates some of the the um enzymes in them so they won't oxidize anymore so it'll just kind of maintain its nice green color um and then so you have these nice little dried out leaves that people then use tea so and we'll get into a tea plantation once and saw this whole thing happen did you did you yeah it was pretty cool yeah like up in the mountains and they there's like all these giant fields of tea and there's these people out there just picking these tiny little tea leaves and putting them in a big bag and then they take them into this big factory where they turn them into all different sorts of types of tea it's pretty cool yeah, that is cool. Uh, did you know the uh, the actual little tree-like shrub, if you just let it grow naturally, it will grow about 30 feet or like 10 meters tall or so. Really? Yeah, but they don't, obviously, for harvesting yeah, reasons. Like they, just, they just keep them super short, so they're really easy to harvest. But so anyway, so 
that's what uh, we'll get into shortly, like why the heating and stuff stops the oxidizing in more detail in an aside here in a little bit, but uh, for now. So black tea, on the other hand, they actually allow it to ferment um, or oxidize. And so they and they actually kind of speed up the process by rolling it and tearing the leaves, crushing them, that sort of thing, uh, mm-hmm. which then will speed up the oxidation process. Um, and then so then once they've done that, then they it's dried out usually like in the sun or they might use machines or something um, to make it a little faster. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically it it turns the leaves will turn from green to black and now you have black tea but the they kind of start out the same it's just sort of the the processing that's different um so when it turns out this oxidation process is a defense mechanism by the plants not just tea leaves but so everyone's familiar with like apples you cut an apple exposed to the air like within not i mean no time at all uh, it starts to turn brown where you've cut it so mm-hmm. where the parts exposed to the air um so why this is the case so Basically, you've damaged a bunch of the cells, which then uh, releases an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase, which then once that's exposed mm. to oxygen will then um, uh, will result in these phenolic compounds that will then the ap- uh Okay, how do you suppose you... Uh, what do you think? Orthoquinones? Oh, dude. <sighs> yeah, I, I mean... <laughs> I forgot to look it up beforehand. I was going to. If you know how to pronounce orthoquinones, I knew how to pronounce the poly the polyphenol oxidase, but I didn't. uh, I forgot to look this one up. Orthoquinones. So, either way, uh, so this this results in these compounds turning into these o quinones or whatever, which are are naturally an antiseptic. So it's sort of protecting the the apple. I definitely think orthoquinones is right. I wouldn't think there would be another way to pronounce that. Okay, cool. Uh, So yeah, so these are natural antiseptic, which sort of protects the apple even when it's injured like that. Um, So these actually don't have any color themselves, but they then further react with um, various amino acids and oxygen to produce melanin, which then it turns brown. So um, given the need for oxygen here, if you want to reduce this process, let's say you cut some apples, you want to take them to work or whatever, if you just put them in like, it needs oxygen, so if you just put them in like a bag and get all the air out of the bag, like a Ziploc bag, and then zip it up, uh, that'll slow it down well, significantly. Why, do, <laughs> why, why do we need to cut an apple? <laughs> like, you know? it's already, I mean, what is so... Like, <laughs> Am I the only one who's like, it's already wrapped in this magical shell <laughs> called, you know, peel, which you then just eat. Like, a, you just rinse it under the tap and eat it. Why do we need to cut it up? <laughs> See, I prefer to cut it. I, I prefer cutting the apples. I even have like a thing that you put on the apple and then you just like push down and then it gets rid of the core and slices them all into perfect little... Yeah, but dude... Are you really going to do that? Then put it in a bag, then suck out all the air and then take it to work. Why not just stick the apple in your bag and be like, oh, well, I guess I get to enjoy my apple in the second preferential way today. <laughs> oh, but then, yeah, then you have to cut it later. No, I, I don't know. To just I, eat it. For, for <laughs> kids, for kids, I cut, you know, my daughter's apples. They're little. They, they're they not going to eat the apple from the apple itself. They got little tiny mouths, you know, like, so you got to. That's true. So just give them a yeah. flick knife so they can do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, another way to do it is to place them in the refrigerator, which is a significant thing. We're going to have a pro tip for bananas in a little bit. So, the- Oh, yeah, your banana thing changed my world. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, so- so- we did a video about this, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Did you just tell me this one? No, time? like years ago. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, maybe a podcast <laughs> or something like, you know. In Since the whole- then, my bananas, oh, I won't spoil it, but okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so uh, so, you- so you can do that. It-, it just slows the chemical reaction, so it'll last a little bit longer. Um, another thing, if you like a lemony flavor to your apples, you can like spritz them with a little bit of lemon juice or, or pineapple juice works as well. And that actually uh, stops the <laughs> polyphenol oxidase from reacting to the oxygen thanks to the acidity levels um so it kind of denatures them um or just and, eat your apple like a normal person yeah or salt <laughs> salt sugar or syrup also <laughs> works you can just salt your apples salt on like, app- yeah just spray that pineapple juice that i've got on hand on there i haven't actually i can't remember the last time i've done this but as a kid i used to love to like salt the apple like the i don't know the saltiness it really improves oh, it's actually good i think yeah. i thought so then i don't know i haven't i haven't done that in years as, as an adult but i used to do it as a kid it was delicious um i've never done it i'll give it a try yeah i don't know maybe it's gross now I've, i really haven't done it in a long time but i was also thinking the other day i didn't i don't have enough salt in my diet so yeah. i really wanted to get more salt in there yeah, yeah. well salt it's good it's good tasty stuff so um yes. so for the same reason they pan fry or steam the tea leaves also you can do the staples which anyone who's made like apple pies knows uh, so if you like uh, heat them to extreme levels that'll also uh, denature the polyphenol oxidase so if you like you know apples like when you're making apple pie you might like drop them in boiling water 
um, after you cut them up. And so that'll stop that from happening. And there's also nowadays they're making like genetically engineered uh, apples that actually get rid of the thing. They stop producing the thing that makes it brown so that you can have like Amazing. the- Amazing. Yeah, right? So yeah. That's the solution. That's one way. And then I think like McDonald's or something, like if you ever get like Happy Meals, they have, um, they have them bagged in the plastic, that thick plastic. And I would suspect, I haven't actually looked this one up, but given the thickness of the plastic and stuff, I bet it's- um, I bet they're actually putting some sort of other, like non oxygen, no oxygen in there. I assume it's just don't they do nitrogen in those things? They yeah, them full of nitrogen. Yeah, probably, and then that probably keeps it from going all brown. So, either way, so so going to bananas. <laughs> That's a, I do love the level of our society. It's like, yeah, we could eat apples the normal way or just cut them up fresh. But it's like, no, what we do is we slice them up perfectly. Then we put them in a plastic enclosure with a tear off top and then pump that full of nitrogen to keep it fresh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we just genetically engineer them. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. we have mastered the world. <laughs> Pretty much you have to assert your dominance, you know, humanity on everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so bananas, little little trick. So a lot of people think, like, you put the banana in the fridge, right? And then eventually it goes all, the peel goes all brown, right? And gets all squishy mm-hmm. and, like, seems like it's gross. But it turns out, while this does happen, uh, and if you actually just open the banana up, the inside is still good. Totally fine. Yeah, it's yeah. still good. <laughs> And what you want to do is you wait until it's the perfect ripeness that, that you like. You know, everybody's got slightly different preferences there. Uh, so then once it's there, plop it in the fridge. It's good for about a week uh, where the inside won't, won't really change too much. Uh, but the outside will go all brown like, like you know, like normal. But uh, yeah, and then ju- it's just the, just the outside. It's all good. Yeah, man, this, this really was revelationary for me. And it took, yeah. it took ages to get my wife to be like, just put it in the fridge. And it'll be fine. And she's like, no, no, it goes nasty. It goes nasty. So eventually yeah. I just shove them in the fridge. Yeah. And then I'm like, yeah, you see how they're brown and nasty? Yeah. And you just undo it. And it's like, it's good. Yeah. Great and on the inside. Good. And it's, it's actually, awesome. there is a there is a, a myth. And it's not, the, the peel is also not nasty, you know? It just yeah. is brown. Yeah, it just, I mean, brown people, you know, it doesn't look, it's kind of like uh, avocado. It just and, looks nasty, but it's not like weird and soft, you know, like when you've got a, uh, like moldy banana. Yeah, yeah. And it's the uh, same like with, banana. with apples when they go brown on the outside. It's not, if you actually taste it, it's not, it doesn't really taste different really, you know, mm-hmm. uh, at first. And I mean, eventually it'll go bad, like really go bad. But uh, <laughs> it's been staying out for a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's same like avocados. They turn brown really fast and it's the, for the same reasons but they you know it actually looks disgusting but as long as it's not been too long it, it's not going to taste gross um so yeah so um the, there there's a myth that popped up some people might have heard so they might be like wait a minute if you put the banana in the fridge though it produces like different toxins and stuff like chemicals like chemical reactions happening that are toxic to humans but this myth is actually thanks to an a, well i should say it popped up shortly after an old chiquita banana ad so some people uh, attribute it to perhaps the Chiquito banana ad kind of inspired the myth. So the the this okay. this ad states, "I'm Chiquita banana, and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way." Oh, it's a poem. <laughs> When they are flecked with brown and have a golden hue, bananas taste the best and the best for you. You could put them in a salad. Yeah, but don't do that. That sounds that no. Sounds that's not disgusting. Right. Yeah. I mean, unless it's a fruit salad. Even then, fruit salads are kind of gross, I feel like. No, I like a fruit salad. Really? Yeah, no, I just... Like, I, yeah, you could put some apple in there and you put some mm, juice and... No, no, no. Way too sweet. Me. Way too sweet. I like it separate, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> I like to have all the flavors separate. <laughs> it's true. Uh, you could put them in a pie eye. Did they just not know what to rhyme with something so they just made up a word? They did. They did. The way they spelled <laughs> it, it, it appears that way. <laughs> Any way you want to eat them, it's impossible to beat them. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator, so you should never put them. Yeah, you show you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. Yeah, big chiquita. Put a boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, they're like, yeah, don't ever put them in the refrigerator because then they sell more bananas. But um, yeah, they, chiquita now. By Who the way, came up with this. This is some weak. I think this rhyming. was from like the 1950s, though. So. Like if I remember okay, correctly, cut. so it was a long time yeah. ago. This was like the early days. If, of- if I know anything, things got good in the 1960s because that's when Mad Men set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, advertising in the earliest was was bad. So either way, Chiquita <laughs> nowadays, if you go to their website and stuff, they actually do say they recommend this whole put it in the refrigerator thing. Um, but back back then they didn't. And then shortly thereafter came the the myth popped up, started spreading around that you know bananas in the mm-hmm. refrigerator is bad for you. Uh, it's not. It's awesome. So. 
uh, yeah, other ways to keep bananas fresh longer. We're going to get, this is interesting just because of um, some different things about bananas. So it turns out. It kind of sounds like they just wanted to sell more bananas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 back then. Advertising yeah. back then like, was so. Yeah, if you, don't, if you put them in the fridge, they'll poison you. Yeah. So leave them out, don't eat them and buy some more. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coincidental that it popped, that rumor yeah. popped up shortly thereafter. <laughs> so, uh, yeah advertisements back then though you go look at a lot of them they were so unethical like they, they could just say anything like they would just completely whatever um i made a whole video about this on my new business place channel oh yeah check that out yeah listeners uh, about like patent medicine claims yeah you know, like those crazy drugs it's like yeah cocaine drops for kids it's yeah like, whoa what does it cure everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pretty much yeah. yeah it's pretty good just full of lies so that brings i was going to say we were uh people can tell us if they like this idea or not um so what, what's our email podcast uh, at brain food whatever it is i haven't checked it in forever so you can email me i'm at, i'm my my email like public email address is simon at simon com. okay i actually get that and i do okay. check it yeah and i'm david at today i found out dot com so uh so oh i also check simon at today i found out dot com oh, there that you actually go. forwards to my gmail which is there pretty convenient what it's got to be like podcast at brain food but don't email us there because <laughs> it's been six months since i even looked in that email inbox yeah. have you looked in there at all no or or on the forum no, now i'm afraid because i know there's going to be like a million emails and yeah. i don't want to have to go through them all <laughs> yeah uh, they, people can go on the forum either way the idea is this what if we occasionally like once a month just to give some more episodes a little bit easier if we just did sort of our best of the last month where simon on the channels he's working on out there and then on today i found out and we just kind of briefly discussed discuss what we've come up with in like a casual casual way do people would people like that episode that type of episode let us know yeah let us know it would allow us to make a few more episodes because we're you know we're at one a month now. We yeah. could easily up that if we did something a little yeah, less Yeah, because that would, that would be way faster. Because I just went over all that stuff. So it would just be, I probably wouldn't even have to prep, I don't know, more than a few hours. Just kind of. Yeah, it'd be like, you've written it. I've read it. We're already pretty familiar with the material. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyways, if people like that idea or not, let us know. Uh, and we might give it a try and see, see how it turns out. But um, so bananas, it turns out other ways to keep bananas on the, on the shelf going uh, from going bad so fast. So it turns out bananas release a really large amount of this hormone called ethylene and so or at least relative to other fruits and so this is one of the reasons if you've ever had like bananas that are super brown and you put them in like a fruit bowl like with a bunch of other fruits the other fruits will get will ripen much faster and go bad faster as well because this ethylene actually uh significantly increases the, the rate of ripening um so that's um so that's one a pro tip is to separate all the fingers of the hand of the banana uh, from each other away on the counter. And this will slow the, the ripening process. Or alternatively, if you want to speed up the ripening process of some bananas or like you bait, maybe you bought a fresh like thing of a bunch of green bananas and you got uh, the old bananas that are now all brown. Uh, just put them together like in a paper bag or something overnight. And by the next day, it'll be super ripe, which is actually how the manufacturers do it. So when they first harvest the, the bananas because they're doing it from, you know, they want to ship them all over the they world put them in a paper bag together over yeah. <laughs> no they they what they do is they They've do got a more commercial process they have a more commercial process so they do it when they're super green and hard which also makes it good for transportation without bruising uh, and stuff like mm. that so they're like you know crazy hard and not ripe at all and so they get it and then once it gets to your local distribution warehouse or whatever uh where it goes out to all the stores they'll then put them in a giant room and then they just release a certain amount of the ethylene into the air in that room and then that speeds up the ripening to get them where they need to be to then go out to the stores depending on you know how far away the store is and so that that's kind of has how they do that so you can use that at home though which just if you have like some overripe bananas and put them together uh, with other stuff if you need to speed once up once again we have we have mastered the world yeah <laughs> it, well this this is the the this one actually um the ancient egyptians used to use this method they would slash figs and then they put it with different things to speed up the uh, yeah. the ripening so they didn't know anything about you know ethylene but they had observed at some point that this happens uh when you when you take overripe things and put them together so um this is also actually why the the where the phrase the one bad apple spoils a bunch came from uh so because this is basically exactly what's happening so you have a bad apple so there's just like a one that's wounded like it's got a cut in it or it's been bruised like significantly and you know that sort of thing or, or it's just like way overripe and if you put it in with other apples then so like apples last a really long time especially if they're kind of cold stored a little bit um if there's none of them are bruised or anything they'll they'll stay that way they'll store really well but you get one of them 
that's bad or overripe and you put it in and that reduce that produces ends up producing a lot more ethylene uh, from this overripe because as it ripens it produces more and more and then so then the, the apples around it will start to ripen faster and then they produce mm-hmm. more ethylene and all around it just like very quickly the entire um, box of apples or whatever is is overripe so um yeah. So another way of saying, you know, one bad apple spoils the bunch. You could say also one bad apple like brings your fruits to perfect ripeness. Yeah. As long as you don't let it yeah. go for too long. Or vegetables, <laughs> like it helps the the, yeah. the, the ripening there. Um, so yeah. Um, so going back to tea, because that's uh, that's how we started. So there's other types of tea between just uh, black and green. So people know probably know white or oolong. I don't know. I've never actually had a white or oolong tea. I had. I've got oolong tea in my cupboard right now. Really. Yeah, I had it last weekend. It's pretty good. My wife likes it more than I do. I'm like a black tea yeah. Englishman. So, yeah. But I like trying all the weird teas. Yeah. Yeah, so oolong is just made, it's actually processed uh, similarly to the black tea, but all they do, the difference depends on the manufacturer and the exact type and everything, but what they do is they take mm. it, so you got the, you know, the, the raw leaves or whatever, and they'll allow it to oxidize a certain amount, depending on the type and everything, and then they'll, they'll, pan fry it or, or steam it or whatever to to stop it at a certain point so it just a lot sooner than the black tea usually um and so it depends on the type you might get it more it's more of like a green tea or more of like a black tea but um yeah uh, and then white tea is just made by they just pick the leaves and buds early basically uh before they mm-hmm. fully matured so when the, the buds are still closed and everything um and then they usually just dry it out or whatever to um and just kind of heat it to try to minimize oxidation but um yeah that's white tea so now, moving on from there to another food discussion, the difference between fruits and vegetables. So, like everyone... I'm not getting hungry at all today. You know, like whenever we talk about food, you know, yeah. we'll discuss like the history of pizza or something, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, getting hungry. Yeah. Now we're just talking about fruits and vegetables. It's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is like, funny, isn't it? I'm not like, oh, yeah, I really crave some no. celery right now. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. So... I mean, everyone always the joke is like, oh, tomatoes are fruit. And there was that, that thing a few years back. Did you hear about the thing with the U.S. where the whatever for school lunches, they have to have a required amount of fruits, you know, like that. And so then uh, the tomato. OK, there was a thing where like the, the tomato sauce on pizza uh, was it ended up getting <laughs> it ended up counting. Um, so yeah. uh, for a fruit, even though, you know, but so for even, a fruit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Tomato, I mean, technically is a fruit or is it a vegetable, right? So which is it? There's always the different uh, stuff. So so the actual difference between fruits... It's and, a vegetable. It's a vegetable. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, it's also it's a fruit too. It depends whether you're talking about... So the, there's the botanical... I'm not a botanist. Yeah, but... I'm an eater of tomatoes. <laughs> but if you do it by like the, the eater, of people the eater of side of things, it's completely... Yeah, it's but it's so arbitrary on that side. Whereas if you do it on the botanist side, this is where this is where all the confusion comes from. Is the difference between these two systems? That one is regulated. And it's like this is a fruit, this is a vegetable, where it's consistent, right? And whereas the yeah. the the culinary side is just all over the place. Um, so as uh, because it's you know there's like the history of things and and that. So and to outline it, so here, so it turns out many foods. So you got like so beans. Corn, bell peppers, peas, eggplant, pumpkins, cucumbers, squash, and tomatoes. Uh, so they're all fruits, it turns out. So even, yes, beans, corn. Uh, so that's botanically speaking, of course. So it's basically fruits are the part of the flowering plants that contain the seeds and are by the means by which such plants disseminate those seeds. So if it's got the seed in it and the means in which they disseminate it, that's a fruit. So that includes nuts or fruits, grains, as, as we said, like with corn and stuff. Also, also fruits. Wait grains yeah so if i have peanut butter on toast that's technically two servings of fruit <laughs> yes from botanically what? speaking yeah but yeah this is it it's like botanically speaking but everyone knows that that's not yeah. two servings of fruit so where what is botanically speaking what's a vegetable then a vegetable are all the other parts of the plant so that can be the leaves the roots the stems uh, everything like even the flower buds um themselves which like broccoli and cauliflower so okay. that that's a vegetable it's got the seed. I don't like these botanists. Yeah, but <laughs> it's really consistent. It's like, this is a fruit, this is a vegetable. There's no confusion on any of it. So that that's what that It'd is. It'd be a bit confusing taste-wise, though. <laughs> yeah, and that's where culinary-wise they go. The, it's just like tradition, mostly. And honestly, it is just, is it sweet? Uh, but of course, there are some things culinary-wise that are that are 
you know, that are kind of sweet, but also considered a vegetable. Um, but and there's the secondary thing that kind of historically culinary decides the on these things is do you use it as a main part of the dish or do you use it as a dessert? If it's a dessert, it's almost always Ooh. it's going to if it's sweet and it's a dessert, like that's where you're going to use it. It's going to be a fruit. Uh, otherwise, it's, you know, if it's part of the main dish, even if it's like a little bit sweet, it'll be considered a vegetable. Um, and so that's kind of the the distinction there. But I don't know. I like the scientific way better because it, it's very clear, you know. I like the but I like the non-scientific way yeah. because it's the one that everyone uses all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, then you can say like, because, you know, vegetables, they're not sweet and they're all they're all gross. I think. Is there a vegetable that actually is good? I don't know. Dude. There's loads of vegetables that are good. Is there? You mean like from the scientific perspective or not? No, from like the, the culinary side, I can't think. I mean like Dude, car- potatoes. You don't like fries? Well, yeah, but this, I mean fries. But it's... <laughs> it's a vegetable. Is it? Is it considered a vegetable? A, a potato? Uh, culinarily, yes. Yeah, is it? So... It's a I mean like vegetable. a carrot would be considered a vegetable. I just feel like... Also carrot fries are good. Sweet potatoes, sweet oh, potato fries. Don't like, good. don't like sweet potatoes. Oh, no. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. No, yeah, potatoes. Um, potatoes, I guess, if we're going to call that a vegetable. I don't know. I feel like that isn't always considered a vegetable. I don't know. Look, the thing is, why I like the, the normal way and all of this doesn't really matter. Just if I was, if I went to the store and my wife said to me, oh, you know, pick us up some vegetables. Yeah. And I came back with like peanut butter or pick us up, pick us up some fruits. <laughs> you know, I want something to snack on in the day. And I came back with, you know, a loaf of white bread and some peanut butter. She'd be like, what is this? One, well, she'd probably first complain because she's allergic to peanuts. Yeah. And then yeah. she'd also complain that these are not fruits. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. Oh, God. <laughs> And this, I could get, I could get down that because I actually don't really like a lot of fruits either. So this, you know, I like peanuts. peanuts. What do you like? <laughs> uh, I mean, like salty things. I, fruits, I feel like, are too sweet usually, except for like strawberries, ironically. Which, are, but they're they're, they're of, the sweetest fruit. But not necessarily. It depends on how where you, I like that when they're kind of that kind of like tart, you know, but like a little bit sweet, like that stage. So you like unripe strawberries? <laughs> like a little bit ripe. <laughs> let's move on we're never going to come to agreement on this yeah no i eat bananas just to force myself but you know just because i need to eat something honey crisp apples those are pretty good but like but this is going to kill you because i don't really like to eat you, them you force yourself to eat bananas because you need the something <laughs> yeah but the, the honey crisp apples one they're insanely expensive especially in the winter like i i one time i bought like um i bought like a little bag of 10 because you know it's like apples they can't it's not expensive right three dollars per apple like- that's what they were Whoa! yeah i was like what? i was like yeah i'm not buying apples anymore that is ridiculous and it was in the dead of winter so it's like you know like in all of human history getting in you know, apples like that in the dead of winter is you know different but still yeah I felt I felt like such a baller the other day because I was in a video I mentioned on a business place video again. I was talking about are you familiar with tofifi? It's uh I think maybe it's more of a European thing. But someone was like, Oh, you eat tofifi? You're so fancy. And I was like, I had no idea how much it costs because generally I go to the store and I'm like, unless it's in like the fancy chocolate section, I'm just assuming I can probably afford it. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, <laughs> Yeah, look at me. <laughs> Yeah, no, that is, that's the thing is like as an adult. So, you know, I grew up kind of poor or whatever. And so you go to the grocery store, you can't get stuff. You're like, like I could I buy anything. There was, there was like a point <laughs> when stuff started taking off. I went to the store. So, you know, in college, you can't buy anything either. Right. So you're, I mean, everyone's poor in college. And so, but then I go to the store and I'm looking around and I'm like, I, it was Fig Newtons. I was like, I could buy these fig because those are like five bucks, right? About like college or like young yeah. me. Okay. You know, I don't even know if I like Fig Newtons, but I'm going to buy those. And then I was just like, wait a minute, I could buy anything in this store. Like, yeah. like, and it just like dawned on Let's me. Let's just not go to the electronic section and we'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, and I was just like, whoa. It was, it was the exact moment where I was just like, you know, like you say, you like feel like such a, like a baller. You're just like, I could buy anything in this Other store. Other than the chocolate. I have to say it was never really... I mean, I think it for me it was more that I could go to the store as an adult yeah. and my parents weren't there to tell me <laughs> yeah. that I couldn't go to the pick and mix section and buy like a kilogram of candy. Yeah. Because like in a store, I feel, you know, even as a even as a student, it was not like anything is so what like even five bucks, it would be like, I could spring to that. Yeah. 
I know it's it, I'd feel it more than I yeah. do now. Yeah. But it was more just like I could go to the and I, I I could go to the pick and mix section and just go absolutely nuts. Yeah. And I'm going to get to the counter and it's going to be like 10 pounds and I'm probably going to regret my decision. Yeah. But I could. You could. <laughs> you go buy a cake if you wanted, you know, just yeah. because. Yeah. I can go to the alcohol section and buy whatever I wanted. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. That was that I, I still appreciate that sometimes. Like, I'll be like, in the store. And it's like I can buy anything. And some of that though <laughs> is like modern times though, because even like you know you go back like a hundred years ago and you go to like buy some chocolate, right? Like that's gonna be that's yeah. like legitimately going to be expensive. Uh, whereas yeah. now it's like you can buy like even really fancy chocolates. It's not very expensive. Yeah, like it's not all. gonna break the bank. No, like yeah. So I went in. I found like Tafifi. It was like three pounds a box or something. Yeah. Or the, or the equivalent. Yeah. So what, like four dollars? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like. Yep. Never even realized. Yeah. So, yep. where where were we? Okay, we're moving on now. Speaking of fruits. So, the jelly and jam. What's the difference between jelly and jam? And the, now okay, you guys, well, you guys, yeah, call this different. Yeah, right? we've already got problems because yeah. I talked about this on a video and people were like, "So, you don't know the di- you don't know the difference between jelly and jam." And everyone tried explaining it to me, and I still got confused because jelly by us is I think what you call jello. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like uh, what you're using in a hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which Okay, it's, well, enlighten me. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I assume like, uh, well, no, because Jell-O would have uh, some a little bit different because they don't, I don't, it's not pectin, it's uh, whatever collagen from animals or something, right? Like, yeah, it's made from like the, the bones of cows. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, that they boil down <laughs> and everything. Weird. No, and that, I mean, that it makes sense also that that was, you know, the first ones that used to be like a thing in Britain, I think was where that actually first came about. And it's like, of course, like of all the cuisines that would come up with, hey, let's boil those yeah. bones and then nice. take the liquid and then make something out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we love weird shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, but so jelly. What should we add to this pie that's got delicious steak in it? Let's throw some kidneys in there. <laughs> Gross. Or like you got uh, the Scottish, I think. Probably is it is it true? Is it like the more north you go, the weirder it gets? Like Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, but I'm from the south, so I'd say that. I think the northern people would be like, oh, it's normal. Yeah. But dude, putting gravy on chips yeah. is not is not normal behavior. Oh well, no, yeah. 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 So anyways, jelly. Getting the insides of an animal yeah. and then stuffing it inside the stomach of said animal and boiling it <laughs> is delicious, but it's also it's, very weird. It doesn't sound delicious. <laughs> it's pretty delicious. You'd hate it because you'd like nothing, but yeah. <laughs> it's good. No, that's what, what's that one where they do the, that's like really inhumane that we went on that business trip once and they, the, oh, uh, with the, like, the, well, there's foie gras. The one where they like force the animals to not move their whole lives and then they do stuff. Oh, to, veal. Stuff. Well, then, no, then they like, stuff the stuff. It was like a bird of some sort, and then they stuff. Yeah, the, foie gras. Yeah, where they feed the goose through a tube direct into its stomach, that, and then they harvest its super fatty liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was that was foie gras one is of the most disgusting delicious, things. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, see, I, I was I don't I, eat I, it. naturally. I thought it was. Yeah, naturally, I thought it was the most <laughs> disgusting thing I've ever had, and I almost like gagged on it. And I was trying because you know you want to be nice. they're the host; they spend a lot of money to do that. Try to wait. Be like, where did we eat foie gras together? That was in um, uh, uh, Wisconsin. The dinner. Oh yeah, of course. We went to that fancy restaurant. Yeah, which was a crazy nice restaurant. It was like yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, and and you know the host is like going all out buying expensive things and then I, I was trying to like oh i have to somehow eat this like anyway i seriously was trying not to gag the entire time it's so gross um, but yeah just see it as pate just really rich pate oh, no um, anyways jelly and jam uh jelly is made strictly from the juice of the fruit which they just um and so jam is made with the crushed fruit in so basically they add like this pectin uh, to the jelly to kind of and then they boil it down to kind of thicken it and the pectin also um and sometimes sugar of course for fl- extra flavor and everything and they boil that down and then it gets the jelly it gives a nice thick uh, consistency for spreading and then jam is just they just crush it and then you i mean they might add a little pectin but usually not necessary uh to get the nice consistency you kind of just grind it up and then that's that's your jam um they might even mm-hmm. leave the seeds in uh, or may not um so that that is basically the difference so you know jelly when you're spreading it spreads really nice and evenly so that's kind of how you can tell one and then the jam tends to be a little lumpy but if if they grind it up really good it's not too lumpy um and that's actually the difference between like jams and preserves like 
As far as like officially, like the U.S. Food and Drug Administration doesn't really consider jam and preserve to be different at all. But most people, when they're talking about it, so the, the if the preserve if the chunks are super large in the jam, then that's they'll usually call it a preserve. And then if they're small, it's just you know jam. Oh, okay. Yeah. So jam is good. I really enjoy jam. Yeah. I don't think I've really had this jelly stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Depending on whatever the brand or whatever it's. Uh. But yeah. 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 So and then fruit butters. If people are wondering what's how did do they... you have marmalade? Sorry, do you have marmalade? I know what that is, but I don't. I'm sure we have it, but I've never. I don't buy it really. I'm sure it's there on the shelves. I probably just never. I was just wondering if it's a weird British thing. No, I it's mean like, like made from orange and lemon. Yeah, I'm sure it's like on the shelf somewhere. It's just not something I ever got. But it's super popular in Britain, right? Like it's like yeah, it's super delicious. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So now I'm getting hungry. Now I'd be like awesome, like a nice slice of brown toast with some. Uh, Butter and marmalade on yeah. top. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I definitely don't have that at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fruit butters. Fruit butters are basically just uh, so they strain out uh, all the stuff. So so it's basically just similar to jelly, uh, except for they'll just mm-hmm. enrich it with a ton of you know different stuff. Probably more pectin to make it. And then they, when it's all enriched, they put whatever they got to thicken it and everything. Uh, then they'll whip it and then cook it down until it becomes super thick and that is just the fruit butter um and so there's also another one lesser known one is conserves which is this is usually just jam where they mix several different types of fruit together to make it um and then sometimes they'll include like nuts and stuff as well Um, this is pretty popular in europe yeah yeah like you'd have an apricot jam with uh um almonds Mm -hmm. i think with it there's a really popular french brand that does it and it's would you would you call it conserves or do you just call it jam yeah we'd call it a concept oh okay cool yeah so now moving on from there what is the difference between regular virgin and extra virgin olive oils uh so uh it's basically there's two broad categories of olive oil so you have your refined and your unrefined and so you have like your virgin Mm -hmm. and extra virgin are they're in the latter unrefined category and then i don't know it kind of seems interesting the pure pure olive oils uh they are the refined ones and they're not um, really pure in a lot of cases and then light olive oils so those kind of fall under the refined category so how do they do the difference so the two virgin ones they just they don't really do anything to it they just squeeze it uh and uh and then there you go you got it and so like the the highest quality though is the extra virgin and that's uh, so it's basically mostly based on acidity but also taste kind of but obviously that's subjective a little bit on what people think tastes better or not um but um, so the acidity level, um, and so you have like your, your extra virgin olive oil and then the, um, slightly riper olives, they'll do the, um, they also simply press it and then you get virgin olive oil. So it's like, um, so it's a olic, olic acid uh, is how they measure it. So the, uh, if you want to do extra virgin it has to be 0.8% or less, mm-hmm. um, or, and then if just virgin, it's like 2% by, I think it's the U S standards, but also there's an international olive council, which also has their own standards and that's 1.5% to fall under that one and then so pure olive oil and light are made actually from uh if you were to actually to use this it's actually really unpalatable apparently uh it's not good at all so they have to process it uh and so what they'll do is they'll treat it with solvents this pure olive oil by the way is what you know that just seems okay. odd <laughs> yeah. uh, it doesn't sound super pure <laughs> no it doesn't uh, and then high heat so that just removes a lot of the odors and flavors that people don't like um and then mm-hmm. the the end product actually tastes kind of neutral not really awesome either and so they'll sometimes add like virgin olive oil to it to sort of make it taste a little bit more uh, a little bit nicer um and then they'll you know label it as just olive oil or pure olive oil um so in the light the light olive oil they often will blend with other things like canola oil and stuff like that um, so they were fined, uh, less nutritious as you might, uh, guess, but they have a place, a good place because it, it turns out the temperature at which they smoke is, is very different depending on, so you've got your extra virgin olive oil, it's approximately 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have your light, which is 465 degrees Fahrenheit or 240 degrees Celsius, which obviously, so you want to use the light when you're doing stuff like baking and grilling and mm-hmm. frying and stuff like that. Um, and then the other way, like the extra virgin and virgin is great for like dips where you're not heating it at all and you just want something that tastes delicious. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, you, we agree. Yes. 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 Dip, yeah. Like you get some bread, like some fresh made bread. Yeah. And you put some like salt, like obviously salt. I love salt. But so you get like this kosher salt you put in there and some different other seasonings and then 
Now, what about throwing some balsamic vinegar in there? Is that mm, too weird for you? No, balsamic vinegar no, is I also oh, find no. disgusting. <laughs> oh, that's true. Mm, yeah, I'm not also I'm also not a fan of salt and vinegar, but there's something about like yeah. good extra virgin olive oil, a yeah. little bit of balsamic, yeah. whisk it up, salt and pepper, dip some nice sourdough bread in there. Yeah, mm. yeah that is good. Now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> yeah. So what is funny, though, is so uh, you may see things like cold-pressed or extra virgin on the, on the bottle. And in 2015, mm-hmm. Italian authorities, they went and they checked, and nine out of every 20 bottles exported by its top <laughs> exporters were actually tainted with other types of oil in there that weren't, uh, weren't, weren't what they're saying. So obviously this has spurred some extra regulation and stuff like that. So, you have, um, so in the U.S., a really popular one because a lot of um, olive oil comes from California. So you have the Cal- California Olive Oil Council, which will put their oil grade certification on the bottle so you can uh, verify. Or there's also UC Davis Olive Center does their rating and International Olive Council and everything. So you look for the olive olive oil that has... There's a lot of olive regulation. Yeah. <laughs> like all of these international bodies. Yeah, well, they need it, apparently. Look at that Italian. Yeah. And Italian ones, I mean, when you're exporting, you think like, oh, it's from Italy. You know, like it's going to be the best. Uh, but, yeah. but it turns out... <laughs> the finest. Turns out not so much, at least back then. I'm sure they've fixed that problem by now. Uh, or just, you know, look for the... It was only 2015. <laughs> well, but you can just look for like the International Olive Council, like little stamp of approval on there. Um, yeah. Um, this I also didn't know about this. Uh, so if you do have olive oil, some of the bottles will be like clear, right? And if you do have a clear bottle, you actually want to store that in a dark place because the light really degrades the olive oil quite quickly. Um, oh. So if you want, that's why you know. a lot of the, you know, the if you have like your extra virgin olive oil, a lot of the, the bottles will just be completely opaque so no light can get through it all because uh, mm-hmm. it, you know. Um, but it, and the really good ones, if you're storing them in a dark place or they're an opaque bottle and stuff and you keep them away from air, also is another good thing, uh, is uh, 18 to 24 months and then it goes bad. Um, so, and that's another thing, a, a little trick by the olive oil, some of them, the shadier companies, is they will just fail to put when, uh, when uh, like a sold by date on there. And that's usually a good sign that they, they just are giving you old oil. Um, so it's not going to last oh. long. Um, okay yeah 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 i'm like because in my cupboard that's not <laughs> yeah if there's if it, if i've had olive oil in the cupboard for 18 to 24 months yeah i've probably been away for like 18 to 24 months yeah, yeah so where are we where are we okay difference between green and black olives and it turns out uh, there's there's it's just uh, when they're when they're harvested really is the only difference there other than they process it afterwards a little bit differently uh i mean just like a little bit some of the stuff they soak it in but but in both cases uh, they're soaked in a solution containing lye and then uh, fermented in brine, like green olives, for like six to 12 months after they're picked. Mm-hmm. And then uh, kind of the longer the olive is fermented, the less bitter it'll be um, and whatnot. And what then are your it, thoughts on olives? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then... You like them? Oh, my thoughts on olives? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, no, okay. <laughs> no. I was, that was a hard one to guess because they're definitely savory. They're a little bit weird. Yeah, and salt and no green olives. olives can be a little salty, a little bit, uh, but... That's true. Yeah, that brine can be salty as well. Yeah, that's that's kind of the the way they process them. So the green, the green ones tend to be more salty, and then uh, yeah, but oh, otherwise yeah, the black, yeah, the black probably where the salt of, comes uh, from. Right? Of course, the green. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the green, the green. Uh, usually they stuff stuff with them, and too, that's pretty common. Uh, whereas black olives, it's not common to stuff them with things uh, for whatever oh, reason. Yeah. Green olives stuffed with anchovies—that's a weird but delicious food. Yeah. It is weird though. Like, yeah. why? I don't know. Why? Why not? I'm sure there's combinations with black olives that would taste good if they were stuffed, but people people just don't really do that. Um, so yeah, green olives have more sodium and all that, but in, in the end, uh, mostly just the the ripening stage of things uh, is the difference. And so it, this I just thought was interesting. The oldest olive tree in the world, or at least thought to be the oldest, because there's no like universally super accurate way to to tell how old an olive tree is but this this one uh, they got some you know like the the town around when it was built and some different tests they've done on the tree itself is actually two to four thousand years old whoa it still produces olives uh today that you can buy um and obviously they're kind of sought I didn't even know trees could live that long yeah i think there's a couple of trees that are like six or seven thousand years old uh one of them i know wow. We only know the age of it because they just cut they cut it down without knowing it was so old because it wasn't even a big tree. It was just like a little tree. And then they were like, oh, wait, uh, this one, this one. If you go look at the picture of this olive tree uh, of, I don't know, Vuevis in Greece, anyway. Uh, so that one, go look at the picture. It is 
cool looking. Like it would be awesome to have a tree like that on your property or something. Uh, cause it's like an awesome. Oh tree. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah. It's got like a huge, like gnarled trunk. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. And it still produces olives to this day. And it's, you know, two to 4,000 years old, which is just crazy to think about. Someone planted that, you know, like two to 4,000 years ago. Crazy. Wow. Um, yeah. So finally today we're going to talk about the difference between brown and white eggs. So a lot of people think uh, brown eggs are better for you, contain more nutrients. Uh, some people think they taste better or find them to taste better. All this. Some people say like brown eggs are better for cooking things like quiches. White eggs are good for baking cakes, stuff like that. So like ever there, there's all these different things out there on, on, you know, what's preferred for brown or white. But so what's the actual difference? And the difference is that brown eggs are brown and white eggs are white. And that is the only difference. Nothing uh, inside. There's no, there's no yeah. difference on the inside. Uh, with one minor caveat, which we'll get to, but actually doesn't have anything to do with the, um, the, the color of the egg. But there is a, a caveat to that. What's your, what's your default egg color in the States? Uh, white would be, I think it's, is it brown in Europe, right? Yeah. Yeah, I thought, yeah. I thought that was the case. But um, yeah, the, for... Uh, for reasons we'll get to shortly, white is the default. And it's interesting that it's not the default in Europe because it would, I don't know, it seems like that should have happened for the reason why it's popular in the U.S. But um, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so uh, where are we here? So the turns out the amount of nutrition is the same. They taste the same, equally delicious. The, the, the thickness of the shell, a lot of people say that brown eggs are a lot thicker. Uh, they're not. Uh, so there is, there can be a difference in thickness of shell, but it doesn't have to do with the brown eggs or the white eggs. It's just the age of the chicken. So the younger the chicken is, uh, that tends to be typically harder, a little thicker. Yeah. Uh, and then as they get older, it's, it's thinner. So yeah. Uh, and this, this, so why brown eggs are, so white eggs are more expensive in Europe. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> I don't actually know. I think this is probably one of those things, you know, the supermarket times and it's like, yeah. well, they're eggs. I can probably afford them. <laughs> yeah. 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 And eggs are so cheap. Like, it, which is just Although, <clears throat> Yeah. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, to be fair, I will sometimes be like, you know, there's like a million things of eggs. Yeah. And then I'll notice because you'll be like, oh, these are like free range corn fed, super turbo forest raised yeah. pampered chickens. And yeah. then it's like, you want to get six eggs. And I don't know what the price is, but I know it's really high, <laughs> so yeah. I don't buy those. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that in the U.S. at least, brown eggs are more expensive, and the and kind of the reason. I mean, to some extent, it's just marketing because in the U.S., brown eggs do have this perception of being more nutritious and stuff, even though they're not. Um, and so they'll, you know, there's some sort of markup happening for that reason. But turns out it is more than just marketing. So hens that lay brown eggs um, actually usually eat more because they tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, and so they they eat more uh, to maintain their body mass. And so because they eat more, and when you're talking about like hundreds of thousands of chickens, you're, a, you're an egg farmer. It's like a up. Yeah, it adds up. And so they'll usually default to the white egg laying uh, smaller hens. Um, which just uh, kind of a little aside, if you can tell the difference to like, what's, is it going to lay a white egg or a brown egg? And so the white or light colored hens tend to be, uh, have white earlobes and they also tend to do white eggs. And so the brown egg ones are usually dark feathered chickens with red earlobes. And this is just a sort of a general rule. It's not a universal thing. There are plenty of exceptions, but that is sort of the, the indicator you can do. And it is the earlobes are more important than the color of the feathers. Uh, but uh, the is this a genetic thing or is it just random? I assume it's got to be like a genetic uh, thing on some level. Because then, why would you ever have the brown ones or the dark ones? Yeah, well, and that's that's what I that's why I find it curious. Because in Europe, obviously, this I mean, if the white ones are cheaper, why why did the brown ones? Is it is it just like a thing where like Europeans are just used to the brown eggs? So if you introduce the white eggs in mass, Probably. people people will be like, wait, where's my brown eggs? When I was a kid, we had. I'm not even sure you could get white eggs. I mean, I've definitely seen them. Yeah, and maybe I just need to go through all the random boxes that I don't buy at the store. Yeah, I'll, I'll report back to you. I'll yeah. go into the store and I'll find out what the egg situation is. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we have uh, where 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 were we anyway? So, so now we're gonna move on to taste. Mm -hmm. So the taste of them. So some people will say, even there's probably listeners right now. It's like, no, no, I've had brown eggs. 
They totally taste different than white eggs. And so what's actually, this is the caveat, it doesn't actually have to do with the difference in the, in the inherent difference, it's more just the difference in diet. So if you have two mass manufacturers, you know, brown eggs, white eggs, they're going to they're gonna be serving them the same food, like giving them the same food, and the eggs are going to taste the same. They're going to be the same, indistinguishable nutrition value, everything is indistinguishable. Uh, so... But it turns out, like in the U.S. at least, this is how it is, obviously not in Europe, but um, in the U.S., so you have your white eggs tend to be more the commercial variety, and then mm-hmm. a lot of people, their brown eggs, uh, the brown eggs, they tend to get like farmer's markets or, or even like you'll have your free-range eggs at the supermarket, right? And these, obviously, they're going to be eating something different. Often they're just eggs like eat, or chickens eating bugs. and thing. I mean, sure, they'll give them some, some feed, like some corn feed or whatever, like it like normal, but they are eating bugs and stuff like that. And that does definitely actually affect the taste and the the color of the yolk and stuff like that. Um, and so that's that's kind of where the difference in taste actually comes from. If you feed the chickens the same things, it doesn't matter if they're if they're brown or white, it's going to taste the same, same everything. So yeah. So get white egg laying chickens and feed them well. Is that? Yeah, you get more eggs. Optimum there. egg situation. Yeah. So this does bring us. So a lot of people say free range eggs have, uh, you know, higher nutritional value. And so does it actually? And I mean, like, obviously there's. I mean, the taste is different, so the composition is, is slightly different um, when it's eating bugs and things. So yeah, and you see this in like cows. Like if you have like corn fed cows, like primarily, uh, it's gonna the meat tastes actually most people consider it to taste a lot better which is why one of the reasons manufacturers do that, because if you just get one that's just sort of a free-range cow, the meat is is not, I'm mean, in my opinion, not awesome. Um, I agree. So, yeah. I think the corn-fed stuff is better. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a similar thing here. So there is, there is like, you know, going to be some difference, but there is a study uh, by D.R. Jones uh, and all. Uh, agriculture, they... They did it through the Agricultural Research Service and published in Poultry Science. And when looking at all the main factors of nutrition uh, in 2010 is when they did the study, they actually didn't find really any difference at all uh, between the free-range eggs and the other. Um, So they did find difference between eggs and stuff in some cases, but uh, to quote them, they said it varied without one egg type consistently maintaining the highest or lowest values. So kind of just, you know, based on the chicken a little bit. But um, yeah, so not, not too much of a difference. And that bring, that's that's the main part of today's episode. And now we are going to reviews. Uh, I see the review section in our notes is empty. Do you have yeah. any in front of you? Oh, no. I should pull those okay. up. Yeah, I definitely don't. And I'm using my laptop to call you, so it's quite hard for me to pull up the reviews on the... One moment. On the iPad. But let me just see if... Uh... We could just skip reviews today. We could. How, how badly do you want to do reviews? I don't know. They're kind of fun to read. I don't know. I find them fun to read. Okay. Anyway. Let me bring it up. Okay. Um, I realize I've got a podcast app, but I don't subscribe to my own podcast because that would be weird. Yeah. So <laughs> I just need to find it. Um, and then I'm probably going to be in the... Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the check store. So <laughs> yeah. we have one review. Really? Is it from Dami? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> we have one rating. It's not even a review. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm sorry. It is a review. Someone writes, cool, interesting, and fun. Five stars. Thank you, D. Sapicus. That's, in English? Uh, kind of you. I, or did uh, you in just English. translate? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, in English. I, I don't, and I don't know them, so that's good. <laughs> it's not like, yeah. it's not like dummy underscore like a friend w. Of mine or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wife. Um, yeah, so we could do yeah. that one, unless you've got some open in front of you. Uh, no, I well, guess I got, um, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll just do this one. I've not pre-read it, so we'll just go with it. So I started by okay. listening to top tens on YouTube while working 12 hour shifts, then moved to biographics and geographics and business plays. Oh, thus leading me Wait, here. Wait, I found out? What is this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this person. Yeah. That's how they, uh, yeah. Uh, so I've never been. That's a how they found brain foods. Yeah, I've never been a podcast guy, uh, any kind, but I love how much I've learned, and I feel much smarter learning from a European man. Let's admit it. There. <laughs> uh, wow, this is the just shit on Dave and review, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, he says. <laughs> let's admit, if they aren't smarter th- than us Americans, they at least sound like they are. <laughs> so, 
Uh, yeah, he should say elephants are made of, he could say elephants are made of butter. And I'd be like, yeah, that sounds like it could be legit. Yeah, sounds legit. <laughs> yeah. I love the banter between Simon and David and how entertained and I learned at the same time. You make my 12 hours at work go by faster and I thank you. Uh, also, I too have never seen The Princess Bride nor Star Wars. So, yeah. 12 hour shift. I like this guy. I like this guy in every way. That's what is. <laughs> His title was Bromancing Simon, so I, I should have picked that one up. Yeah, right? there was no the doubt. Joker 13. Um, yeah, so let's go to uh, GHBDGS. We miss you. Uh, come back already. They drop fun and interesting knowledge with very good narrative, interesting and down-to-earth comments, and everything is back with uh, bibliography, even if it's a bad one. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, these episodes, they take a long time to put together. And they, they actually end up costing us money even when they're sponsored a little bit. The, the hosting is not awesome. Oh, yeah. That sponsorship does not cover the cost of the hosting, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> like if we, I haven't looked at those hosting bills in a, in, in a while. No, it, it, if like every episode was sponsored and we did like four, then we'd come out like a little bit ahead. Like if, we don't, if we're not really valuing our time like more than you get paid at McDonald's. <laughs> but um, yeah. but uh, the problem is, of course, we can't get everyone sponsored. And also, if we did one sponsored and then we did more episodes, then it just costs us a lot more because the hosting bill goes up. I think our biggest one was like almost $1,000 a little bit ago. Um, <sighs> yeah, yeah. For a month? Yeah, it was a good month. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, uh, you want to do one more? Uh, sure, sure. Um, let's do I like a... that you're doing these. I'm, I'm just chilling out. Yeah. <laughs> let's do another semi-long one because those are uh, sometimes more interesting. So, uh, full of fun information and great to listen to is the title by Red-Tailed Ostringer. So, my introduction to this podcast was listening to Simon on Top 10s. Unlike most Top 10s list on YouTube, Top 10s was very well-researched and easy to listen to. I then ventured into today I found out, and eventually to this podcast. I won't lie, the first episodes I found difficult to listen to. Perhaps the structure and the sound quality, but the show has drastically improved. I like listening when I go for runs. Sometimes I'll hear a tidbit that I previously knew, but then learn the whole history behind the fact. Keep up the good work. By the way, I feel I should mention I may be one one of your few female listeners. Oh, there we go. Actually, with... yeah. There we go. Podcast is better for women listeners, is my it feeling. Is. We don't have demographics on that, right? Yeah, I would guess it's more like a 60-40 uh, for with male, I think. I, there was something that inclined me to that number. Oh, wow, we should do a survey sometime. be interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There. Yeah. There we go. Well, good. Shall I wrap things up? Sure. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Brain Food Show. This wrap-up feels super pointless. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Leave us a review. Uh, we'll be back whenever we're back with yep. another brand new episode check out our wonderful sponsor Skillshare skillshare.com forward slash brain food and uh, we'll be back soon